And we're going to start uh, our Road to Calvary series now, um, where we've advertised this as taking a fresh look at Jesus Christ and his death on the cross. And I want to begin with a verse. Why, why is this so important? Um, Paul the Apostle said this. He said, I passed on to you what I received, which is of the greatest importance, that Christ died for our sins, as written in the scriptures, that he was buried and that he was raised to life three days later. So as far as he was concerned, the most important thing was that we understood that Jesus died for our sins and he was raised from the dead. This is the center of Christianity. And so we're going to spend uh, eight weeks in the run up to Easter, uh, taking our time to receive more and more of the glory of what this was all about. Joe's um, uh, grandfather, my wife's grandfather, was a man called Arthur Ware, and uh, he wrote a book um, which was entirely about the life of Jesus uh, from beginning to end. And as he approached the end of the story, he wrote this. He said, if ever there was a time when we should advisedly remove our shoes from off our feet, as did Moses and Joshua on certain occasions, it is when we are treading out the holy footsteps of the Son of God. And that's what we're doing in these weeks. As he drew near to the supreme climax of his life on the earth in order to accomplish the redemption of the human race. And we're starting um, at what people call the Mount of Transfiguration. Luke chapter 9 and verse 28, it says, Now about eight days after these sayings, he took with him Peter and John and James and went up the mountain to pray. I wonder whether you can imagine what this was like. This is uh, like Jesus' connect group, his small group of trusted friends, Peter, James, and John. These three men were going to be part of writing the next chapters of the story. And uh, they were going up the man. It says they were going up to pray. And also the timing of this. This was actually 33 days before Jesus' death on the cross. So it was just over a month after this that Jesus would die on Calvary. And it's just about a week after Peter's confession. Before Peter's confession, they didn't really know much about what was going on as far as his death was concerned. But do you remember he said to Peter and the others, who do you say that I am? Peter said, you are the Christ, the son of the living God. Jesus said, flesh and blood did not reveal this to you, but my father who is in heaven. And then he explained to them, what was going to happen? Luke 9, verse 22, the Son of Man must suffer many things and be rejected by the elders and chief priests and scribes and be killed. And then a bit of good news. And on the third day, be raised. And so Jesus told them, this is what's going to happen. And on three separate occasions, he explicitly explained, I'm going to Jerusalem. I'm going to die. And yet it took uh, a, a lot for this truth really to sink in. It was a bit like they were blind to it. The next verse kind of joins what we've been talking about in the past weeks of this passage. Verse 29, and as he was praying, as Jesus was praying, you see, he took them up to pray. They thought they were just going to a prayer meeting. I want to say this morning that wonderful things happen in prayer meetings. We had a wonderful prayer meeting last Tuesday evening. and God had been speaking to people um, about, in a way, uh, putting God first, getting rid of their idols, um, preparing our hearts uh, for what God was going to do. And uh, when we pray, we never know what to expect. But Jesus was praying, and as he was praying, it says, and we should expect this too. The appearance of his face was altered. Do you remember? It was the same with Moses two weeks ago. But this time his clothing also became dazzling white. He was changed as he prayed. And behold, it says two men were talking with him. Who were these two men? Moses and Elijah. What were these two men doing here? Well, the cross really is the crossroads of history. 
you know, everything from the cross forward is is um, AD. Everything before it is BC, uh, before Christ. Uh, maybe you could say before Calvary. And in terms of the uh, of God's um, strategy, um, before the cross, we have just shadows of the cross. So the Old Testament was a shadow of the cross. And you see the cross all over the Old Testament. Once you start to see it, you see it everywhere. And you see it in every sacrifice. Colossians 2.17 says these are a shadow of the things that were to come, but the reality is found in Christ. Every sacrifice, every ram, every lamb, every bull, every ox, every pigeon, every dove, um, all that incredible amount of blood that was shed in sacrifice was just a picture, just a shadow of the blood of Jesus that he was about to shed in 33 days' time. That's incredible. Do you remember the phrase that Jesus sometimes uses, the law and the prophets? He uses it a couple of times, and he uses it to summarize the Old Testament. And so these two men here, do you remember we had Elijah last week with Monica, Moses, uh, I spoke about the week before, um, that Moses represented the law. He gave the Torah, the teaching, um, the, the, the rules and the regulations, as it were, Moses gave. And Elijah was associated as a representative of the prophets in the Old Testament. We need these two things, don't we? We need the written word of God, and yet we need God speaking to us. And these men, it says they appeared in glory, and they spoke of his departure, which he was about to accomplish at Jerusalem. And this is a very interesting word, departure. What were they talking about? The Greek word for departure is exodus. We know what that means, exodus. Moses and Elijah were experts on the exodus, weren't they? So Moses, in his life, do you remember, he, he took the children of Israel out of Egypt. It was called the exodus. But he had his own personal exodus. And it's very interesting the, the way that Moses and Elijah, um, they left this earth in a very unusual way. And they had this in common. I was reading this in my readings yesterday. It says of Moses, Deuteronomy 34 and verse 6, And he, that is the Lord, buried him in the valley in the land of Moab. So after he'd showed Moses the promised land, and you know Moses wasn't allowed to go into the promised land, but God showed him the promised land. And that day he died, 120 years old. And it says here, and no one knows the place of his burial to this day. Because as far as they were concerned, God buried him. Maybe because he knew that this day was coming on the Mount of Transfiguration. And then Elijah, again, an unusual death. 2 Kings 2.11, chariots of fire and horses of fire separated the two of them. And Elijah went up by a whirlwind into heaven. And what were they discussing? Of course, they were discussing the most important thing. They were discussing the departure of Jesus, which was the cross. Paul said this. He said, when we preach that Christ was crucified, the Jews are offended Gentiles, Gentiles say it's all nonsense, but to those called by God, that's you, that's me, to those called by God to salvation, both Jews and Gentiles, Christ is the power of God and the wisdom of God, this message of Christ crucified. In Romans 1.16, this incredible verse, for I am not ashamed of the good news about Christ. What is it? It's the power of God at work, saving everyone who believes, the Jew first and also the Gentile. Now, this is more than theory. I know for myself in 1974, somebody simply explained to me the story of the cross. They explained that Jesus died on the cross and he died to carry my sin so that I could be forgiven. And if I personally received that forgiveness, asked him into my life as, as Lord and Savior, as they used to say, then he would come in and my life would be changed. And I can tell you that the next day my life was changed. The power of God that was in this message came into my life. 
and began to make me uh, like Jesus. And I knew him in a very powerful way from that time, in a life-changing way. It's the power of God, this story of the cross. Some people have dedicated their lives to the study of Jesus Christ and him crucified. And you know, in heaven, we are all going to be singing at the other end of the scale. We have Moses and Elijah in the Old Testament. We have the New Testament. And right at the end, we are still singing in heaven. Worthy is the lamb. I think at least 28 times Jesus is described as the lamb of God in heaven. We're going to spend eternity worshiping God for this event, this remarkable event in history. So what were the disciples doing at this point in time? Do you know they were doing what many of us do? It says in, in verse 32, now Peter and those who were with him were heavy with sleep. Heavy with sleep. Why do the disciples always do this? Do you remember in the Garden of Gethsemane, it was the same. Jesus came at this incredible uh, pressurized time of his life to pray with them. They, they missed most of the prayer meeting because they were asleep. And yet I see this in myself. And then it says, but when they became fully awake, they saw his glory and, two, and the two men who stood with him. So they came in on the end of this thing. They woke up when they were fully awake. And you know, that's what I want to pray for myself. I was praying this morning for myself, and I want to pray it for all of us over these weeks, that we will become fully awake so that we can see his glory. Do you want to pray that with me? I'm going to pray at the end. And then it says, as the men were parting from him, Peter said to Jesus, Master, it's good that we're here. Let's make three tents, one for you, one for Moses, and one for Elijah. He was always up for a good idea, uh, Peter, wasn't he? It was a foolish idea, actually. Um, and then we actually have God himself appears in a cloud. It says in verse 34, as he was saying these things, a cloud came and overshadowed them. They were afraid. I bet they were as they entered the cloud and a voice came out of the cloud saying, this is my son, my chosen one. Peter, be quiet. Almost that's what it was saying. And the father was saying, listen to him. And then it says the after the voice had spoken, Jesus was found alone. This is significant. Do you know there's something in all of us that wants more than Jesus? There's something that maybe wants us to hark back to the Old Testament, to the law. Maybe there's something in us that always wants to hear the voice of a prophet. But they were left with Jesus alone because he has become the reality. Jesus has taken center stage. And for us as believers in him, we have him in our hearts. We have him as our hope. We have him as the rock on which we stand. We have him as our savior and our guide and the bread of life, the very life itself. We have Jesus. Jesus was found alone and they kept silent. Something else we have to do here, apart from wake up, and one is we have to listen to him. Do you remember in that verse we, we just read, the, the, the father spoke and he said, listen to him. What do you need to do today? What do I need to do in these days? In these uh, unusual times that we're living in this last year, um, I found myself that there's one thing I need to do. I need to listen to him. And so uh, Bob and I and, and uh, the leaders in the church, uh, we've been trying to listen to him and just do what he is saying. We can't go wrong, really, if we do that, can we? But he doesn't need our good ideas like Peter had. He doesn't need our religion. He doesn't need us building tents unnecessarily. He just wants us to listen to him, to worship him, and to obey him. In closing now, do you remember um, when we were looking at Moses, uh, the thing that he prayed on that mountain was, show me your glory. And the father did, didn't he? He, he? he revealed his name to him at that time. But there is a greater glory than the father showed to Moses. It is the glory of Jesus. John 13 verse 31 says this, and this is right at the end. Do you remember that Jesus was saying, 
all the time. Uh, they were saying, this is your time, Jesus. Mary said it uh, uh, when they, they wanted to turn water into wine. Various points, he said, my hour has not yet come. My time is not yet. But in John 13, verse 31, the time had come. And that time was when he was going to give his life on the cross for us. And it says, when he'd gone out, Jesus said, now, now is the Son of Man glorified, and God is glorified in him. So Jesus is most glorified in his death. We're going to finish there now and uh, just pray for a moment. So uh, wherever you are, if you'd like to, uh, you can keep your eyes open or you can close them. But uh, let's just pray through what we have just uh, read this morning. Father, we thank you that this is holy ground on which we tread. This story is a holy story. Your death on the cross was a holy death. Father, we want to take our shoes off and reverence and worship you this morning, Lord. Father, we thank you. They just went up for a prayer meeting. And you revealed yourself. Lord, we're praying too, Lord. Could you show us your glory? Could you in these days show us the glory of Calvary? Father, could you help us to be silent and to listen to what you are saying and take what you are saying very seriously? We pray in Jesus' name. Amen. Amen. Well, thank you very much for listening uh, to that this morning.